Good morning. Welcome to our seventh annual education forum. I'm so excited to see you all here today. Uh, what I've been sharing with the speakers is how incredibly lucky and blessed I feel to work with such great educators who are always pushing the field forward. And today is a day to really celebrate education and for us all to think more deeply and broadly and in new ways around some topics that we've thought about a lot before and also some new topics. Um, with that, let me introduce you to our day. So today we're gonna have a plenary uh, speech that I'll be talking a little bit more about in a moment by Gurpreet Dhaliwal. And then we'll have three workshops. We'll have one on mentoring to promote autonomy, one on tech tools and how to, and teaching strategies to be an innovative uh, educator. And then yes and, applying lessons from improvisation to teaching. And then we'll have a second set of workshops on teaching pedagogies for medical educators. And it's about PRIME, transforming your notes and verbal feedback into an effective written evaluation. And then we'll celebrate with lunch at the end of the day. And I would like to say a huge thank you to our speakers who come from UCSF, UC Davis, come from Vanderbilt, CHLA, and then speakers here from Stanford. Um, and really wanted to bring in a, a wide range of educators who can really help us think, uh, continue to think deeply about education. I also wanted to give a huge thanks to Allison Guerin and to Serena Tom who have really been instrumental in planning this day and also to our whole planning committee, to Margaret Murphy who oversees our postdocs, to Mary Rorden who oversees, uh, she's the genetics coordinator, Sarah Hilgenberg, one of our associate program directors, Kevin Coe, also an associate program director and the fellowship director for PICU and then Diane Stafford, who's an educator in Pete's Endocrine. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Gurpreet Dhaliwal. He is a clinician educator and a professor of medicine at UCSF. He sees patients and teaches medical students and residents in the emergency department, on the inpatient wards, and um, in the outpatient clinic at the SFVA. He studies and writes and speaks about clinical reasoning, um, how to make diagnoses, how to help, help all of us uh, learn from our, to uh, learn to diagnose patients better, and what motivates us to improve our practice. He's a member of the UCSF Academy of Medical Educators, and the UC, he's a member of the UCSF Department of Medicine Council of Master Educators. He's published over 115 articles around clinical reasoning and um, really uh, has gotten us to think differently about how do we really promote clinical reasoning in ourselves and in our learners. Jeff Feinstein and I have actually wanted to bring him down to Stanford for the last five years to really um, help us think more deeply about this. Um, I just wanted to um, highlight that he's uh, done a number of podcasts as well to really be able to get the word out to help us uh, continue to think around clinical reasoning. So he's been a podcast guest on The Curbsiders, I Am Reasoning, The Clinical Problem Solvers, Explore the Space, and, um, and where he's discussed cases and discussed processes for thinking through cases. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Dollarwall. Thank you, Dr. Blankenberg, for that very, very kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for uh, spending your morning with me. Um, I know this is uh, both a medical education day, but also it's a pediatric grand round. So I'm here as a guest, as a non-pediatrician, uh, but as a, a full-time teacher who's really pleased and honored to talk about this. Um, just so you know what I do do, I think you heard most of it, uh, which is that I'm a full-time clinician. So I spend five or seven days a week taking care of patients. I work in uh, uh, the emergency room 12 months a year. I work as a hospitalist four months a year. I work in the clinic one half day a week all year long. So if you're doing the math, you probably recognize that there's a bit of overlap. And it is a really unique job. I actually um, am a hospitalist a lot of times while I'm an emergency room physician. So I admit patients to myself. Um, and in the course of doing that, it really gives me a front row seat and sort of the arc that happens on a patient journey and so part of trying to get better at that is understanding not just go, what goes on in their hospital journey or, or acute care journey but also what goes in our mind and the part of medicine I love so much about medicine but the part that has always captivated me is sort of what goes on in our in our mind when we're trying to figure out what's wrong with this person who's right in front of us 
So the goal of today, that there's, a, there's a lot of meta goals and objectives, but I think the biggest thing is that everyone is in the business of teaching clinical reasoning, whether we know it or not. And so the only question we want to raise for ourselves is when I'm listening to someone's narrative, when they're telling me, a learner's telling me about a patient, can I analyze what's going on with them? And then can I get better, at, can I get them better at it? And that maybe can I get better at it myself? And that's the big overarching goal. That's what we're going to spend our 45 minutes on. But there is a smaller, more subversive goal that we all should try to adopt as well, which is we're also in the business of evaluating people. One of the um, joys of being a clinician educator instead of clinician only is that you have to do a DX, RX on the patient who's in front of you, and you have to do a DX, RX on the learner who's in front of you, and you have to do both of them in parallel. Um, but quite often we fall short on that second one. You might see yourself writing evaluations like, well, my diagnosis is that their um, fund of knowledge is a little bit low, and my prescription is just that you need to read more and see more, and you're going to do just fine. And, and while that's a, a really well-meaning uh, prescription, um, it's a really useless one as well, right? I don't think anyone was ever on the bubble, like, you know, should I read more or less? <laughs> and my attendings told me I should read more, so maybe that's what I'm going to do. Um, we want to move past that kind of diagnosis. We need to get more granular, and we have to get much better in the prescription that we apply. So clinical reasoning is a thing, and it's sort of a black box. It's an enterprise that was going on for about 40 years, and the goal of clinical reasoning when it was started to get studied in the 70s was, can we figure out what goes on inside a clinician's mind when someone walks in with this set of data, and then they walk out with the diagnosis? And it's a very interesting process. It's what we're going to spend our time on. But I want to acknowledge it's only half the story. Um, and for 40 years, the focus has just been on this, the question of diagnosis. But there's an equally valid part of clinical medicine that we don't spend as much time on, which is what goes on in our mind when we ha make a treatment. And one of the new frontiers, I'm just going to touch on it today, but just for you to know, one of the new frontiers is that sometimes we're in a situation where the diagnosis is pretty clear. Either we've gotten to that point or a patient comes to us pre-labeled. And what does that process look like when the clinician or me as a teacher has to teach how we choose among all the different therapeutic options as well? And there's two parts of it. So that really clinical reasoning equals DX reasoning plus RX reasoning. And we oftentimes are juggling the two. But one of the important points about this is understanding that it's a thing. Like, clinical reasoning is a theory. It's a set of principles. It's a set of lingo. And like all of these theories and principles and theories, when they're created, they have to be valid in the real world. They have to explain the phenomenon that we see. That's a premise of science, right? You know, when um, uh, Kepler made his laws of planetary motion, he can't just say, I have a theory. They have to explain stuff. They have to explain why Jupiter would be in that position in this month and be that way every year. And one of the things that clinical reasoning grappled with as a field was trying to explain phenomenon like this. Because for decades, attendings have been, you know, you should take a thorough H&P. You should collect great data. If you could just do that, all the reasoning would follow. And that sounds great. It makes for a marvelous uh, talking point. But then they said, how come this is true? That as you move further and further in your training, as you go from a student to a resident to a senior resident to a fellow, a junior attending and senior attending, oftentimes that transition is marked by collecting less and less data per patient encounter and yet proceeding with higher and higher accuracy. That's the first interactive exercise I want you to do. Just turn to your neighbors and say, why is this that that's true? If we believe thoroughness in data collection is such a virtue, um, why is it that this phenomenon unfolds? So just spend 60 seconds at your table, uh, and we'll move on, because this is one of the core challenges that we faced in medicine. Okay, well, let's come back together. Um, I, I won't be soliciting audience input, but I was sort of listening for what I heard, and I think 
people said some of the things that you might anticipate. For instance, like you have experience over time, so you start to learn like what might matter. You um, have a good sense of what signal versus noise is. There's um, places where you've been before, or problems that you've seen before, and all of those things are true. And I think when we translate those sort of um, phrases into some of the clinical reasoning lingo that we'll talk about, we'll see that that explains the things we do here. We'll say things like you have more advanced illness scripts, or you have a schema that's more efficient for going down to the solution, or that you can use pattern recognition instead of analytical reasoning. All of that language you'll use to describe this phenomena. Now, I have to say, um, I've started teaching clinical reasoning to my students and residents, and, and they are equally engaged in this just as faculty do. And when I show them this graph and I say, listen, like, what's the story? Why is it that I, as your attending, collect less data than you do, but sometimes I get, I get to the answer better? And they say, that's because we collect the data for you. And I say, it's true. <laughs> I'm like, there's truth. <laughs> there's, no, there's no denying that. <laughs> so sometimes you even have to deal with theory in a, in a way that you didn't expect. But even when we get through ourselves, there's something in the way we acquire experience that allows us to do that. And that's what we're trying to, to deconstruct here. One of the interesting things about clinical reasoning is it's such a virtuous term. We do it all the time. We love it. It, we, it has a sense of I know it when I see it. But there's a real recent literature in clinical reasoning that says exactly where are the boundaries of that. Like on the simplest level, it's like, well, I just got to define a problem, solve it, um, and get to an answer. And that's probably at its core. But if you look in the literature, there's, there's a real boundary condition problem in clinical reasoning. And other things like professionalism and competency and validity all have the same thing, which is exactly where does it end. Uh, people have made very salient arguments that communication skills are part of clinical reasoning, that high value care is part of clinical reasoning, that ethics has a role in clinical reasoning. And those things are all true on some level. But one of the things you have to do when you study or at least teach a domain is say that I'm going to try to put some bounds around it when I try to get better at it myself or teach others. Um, some of the emerging ways that people are thinking of clinical reasoning now is not just what goes on inside the doc's brain, but how do I work with the system? And how does the EMR affect my reasoning? How do I work with an interprofessional team? And how does that uh, lead to my solutions in solving cases or even working with the patients? Um, but Meredith Young, who's written two recent really good papers on this, says you kind of have to, at some point, adopt an analogy that comes from differential equations and mathematics, which is that you put boundaries around it. You say everything is multifaceted and can have spin-offs. But at some point, we have to say, this is where we're going to start as our starting point, and then we grow from there. And in clinical reasoning, the, the approach that you'll see me taking is the cognitivist lens. But I don't want to make it sort of the be all, end all. There are systems factors, patient factors, and other skills that come into this. But as a core, we'll focus on what goes on inside the clinician's brain. In order to do that, we have to take the lens of a learner who watches us. So we sort of work under this apprenticeship model a lot. And whether it might be a patient who's never seen a doctor think or a learner who's been traveling with docs and says, well, what happens in the doctor's mind? Well, usually the outside observer is going to see that the clinician collects a ton of data and then magically out pops a diagnosis. Like, I think this is septic joint. I think this looks like a temporal arteritis. This seems to be skiffy. Like, you just say those words, and the learner is left sort of trying to connect the uh, pieces or connect the dots. And some people are better narrating it than others. But one of the things that becomes clear over time is that there's multiple steps along the way that you need to narrate for that learner. Or if you're watching them, you have to know to find in their own narrative that they give to you. And this is where the lingo of reasoning comes in. So one of the things that happens is it's nowhere near as simple as what was just there. It's not a magic process. Instead, when you map out the things that the brain does, and these are done through a series of cognitive psychology experiments, some in medicine, but a whole lot outside of it, because clinical reasoning is actually no different than any other problem solving. This is the exact same way you deal with every single dilemma in life. Like, if you're, you can take your home life, you can take your work life, you know, if your car is making a noise, this is the way you'll think through it. It's the way your mechanic thinks through it if you bring it there. At home, if your two kids are fighting and you have to figure out who's right or wrong and what's going to be the discipline plan, you use this. If you're at home and your Wi-Fi goes down and you have to figure out how am I going to fix the Wi-Fi, you do the exact same process. And God help you if you have the last one. The only thing I know in the last one is to unplug and restart. And it underscores one of the things that reasoning isn't a core competency. I'm a very good reasoner when it comes to shortness of breath because I've been practicing that for 20 years, but I'm not a very good reasoner when my Wi-Fi goes up. I'm just waiting for my teenagers to come of age where they can help. Reasoning is a very content-specific thing. It's not an innate skill that you have. It's how much you've mastered the domain uh, as the starting point.
So one of the first things that the brain does when someone walks in the door is it starts to size up the situation. This is framing it, and in the lingo of clinical reasoning, it's called problem representation. So I'm hearing a lot of things as the patient is talking to me, and maybe the EMR sent me a note, and the triage nurse may have told me something. But ultimately, my brain's like, all right, it sounds like this is a 21-year-old man with well-controlled HIV who's here with a cough. Like, that's the problem I have to solve, so I have to define it. Then I have to decide how am I going to solve that problem. And the thing that the brain will usually do is start to fail into a branching algorithm. It starts to say, that's an unbounded problem. It's too big. I'm going to start to create branch points. Like, does he have a fever or not? Do I feel this is infectious or not? Within each one of those branch points, are there then further steps I can take? And whether I know it or not, what I'm really sorting through is a series of solutions that I've acquired, both through school and through experience. So like the way I can solve that problem of a 21-year-old man with HIV and a cough is to conjure up the solutions. One solution is that this is just a viral URI. Another possibility is that this is pneumonia. A third is maybe this is something more indolent, like a mycobacterial infection or fungal infection. But any way you cut it, I have to find a way to sort among those different scripts. And as the brain keeps sorting through them and going back and taking more history and maybe doing more labs and exam, eventually it gets to the final stage in the process, which is called script selection. So those files are called illness scripts. I'll come back to them in a second. But the last step it has to do is select among them. And it's oftentimes agonizing, right? Like how much time do we spend saying, is this viral or is this bacterial? You know, if, if someone has got abdominal pain, you're like, is this gastroenteritis or is this appendicitis? If someone's got chest pain, I'm like, is this heartburn or, or is this a heart attack? Um, those are the things that you sort of struggle with in that final stage of script selection. And oftentimes very high stakes decisions happen. Like are they going to get antibiotics or are they going to get immunosuppression? Are they going home or are they going to get admitted? That final script that you assign to the person um, oftentimes determines what we do next. But out comes the diagnosis. And all of those steps happen in our minds, and all of those steps happen in a learner's mind as well. Um, but if we're trying to get them better at it, we have to dissect it. And in order to dissect that process, clinical reasoning has come up with a set of lingo that's uh, associated with each one of those steps. And I want to say, tell you what they are, and then I'm going to define them in a little bit detail. So that first step I mentioned when someone frames the problem is called problem representation. It's critically important. It's a linguistic exercise, but it has reasoning baked into it big time. Which, you know, if I chose to say someone is a 16-year-old boy with a fever or a 16-year-old boy immunocompromised with a fever, those are two different problems that need to be solved. The algorithm is called the schema. And we have schemas for lots of things. We've been taught them, but they're sometimes called frameworks. Sometimes they're called algorithms. Uh, this is the thing, like one day I, someone taught me about acute kidney injury, and they said there's too many of those things. So I'm going to give you some categories. Try pre-renal, intrarenal, or post. Someone taught me one day about anemia, and I had one professor who really liked the kinetic approach, so she was very big on whether you use reticulocytes, high, low, or medium. I had another professor who was really big on the morphologic approach, so he taught me low MCV, medium MCV, high MCV. It's totally fine. There's no right or wrong, and my brain can amalgamate both, but I had two schemas for it. And then all of those diseases were taught to me over time. The last part about actually how you uh, select a script isn't taught as often as you'd think. It's a lot more you kind of like look around and say how people choose between diseases, risk tolerance, psychology, what we tend to see, um, but then out comes a diagnosis. But each one of those words is a point of intervention. The, the, uh, the step that's probably the easiest to discuss, but oftentimes is an overlooked uh, teaching opportunity, and one I'm trying to get better at is problem representation. So problem representation is saying, given all the data at hand, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? And we have it in a lot of our interactions. It's sort of when you say, hey, call the ID consult. You're saying, like, summarize the problem for them in a one-liner. If you're signing out a patient to someone at night, that's a problem representation. But the most formal place we probably do it is when we ask someone to present. Like, if a fellow is coming and they're going to present uh, the case to you, you say, like, what is the summary of what's going on with this patient? And we sometimes think of it as a linguistic exercise. We sometimes think of it as a break. But it's actually a clinical reasoning exercise, but only if you take uh, the opportunity. So let's say um, uh, someone presents to me, and they say, this is a 16-year-old boy with a subacute intermittent cough and shortness of breath. And I'll say, that's a very nice synopsis. But I might make a teaching point of saying, you know, I wouldn't describe it as intermittent. Actually, he's had the cough every single day. And if anything, that's getting worse. So I would substitute that out. Um, and I'd say I'd take out intermittent and I put in progressive. 
and then the student will be like, all right, it looks like my teacher's a stickler for English. Like, I'll call, I'll, I'll put in progressive, that's what he wants. But I say, no, that I, I owe you an explanation for it. The reason I want you to use progressive is because among the different diseases we're going to sort through, some of the more benign ones are, are maybe are intermittent, but some of the more serious ones are progressive and unrelenting, and we can't ascribe any improvement to anything other than, or change other than the disease itself. So be like, okay, now I understood why you modified it. Or maybe you say, like, there's a 19-year-old girl who comes in with a fever and a headache. And you say, well, you call her a 19-year-old woman with a fever and a headache. Um, I would have said a 19-year-old college student with a fever and a headache. And you said, well, okay, why, why, is my, why does my teacher want me to put that in? Fine, note to self. I'll tell him every every, where everyone went to school every time I presented them. And you say, no, no, that's not my goal. I'm not interested in their uh, academic pedigree. The reason I want you to put it in college student is because one of the solutions to that problem downstream um, is meningococcal meningitis. One of them is meningitis. Downstream to that is meningococcal meningitis. And the inclusion of that demographic information clues you and your listener to that. And they'll be like, oh, okay, only in this scenario would I do it. So when people give us summary statements, it's a real opportunity to teach, but only if we catch it as such. The core of reasoning skill actually is in what's called our illness scripts. So scripts are these things that are drawn from uh, the psychology literature. It means something that the brain sees in a familiar way and is seen over and over and over again. And it's really our encapsulation of the diseases that we use in our domain. So, so a script is sort of like a play that you run again and again. Like I work at the VA hospital, so the script I pull on more, more often than anything else is CHF. So CHF is what I do, it's what I spend all my time on. It's like an old friend, like if a patient walks in, I'm like, you know, CHF, like we meet again. Like I've seen you, I've seen you in your many ways and shapes and sizes. I know all your variations, they're all encapsulated in this script. The history that you'll tell me, the physical exam that I'll see, the times when you will and won't have rows, the times when your EKG will be abnormal, abnormal are normal. All of those things are, in, are a play that plays out in my mind. And it can't be because I saw you once. It's because I've seen you many, many times in many, many shapes and sizes, and that's what forms the script. Um, our job in clinical reasoning oftentimes is to be in the script building business. And their scripts are being updated constantly. Like just two days ago, the American Thoracic Society and IDSA said you can finally put a death knoll in this idea of a healthcare associated pneumonia. Like, sorry, that was our bad. Uh, we gave a lot of antibiotics. Let's dial that back now. And so that's a modification to your script where you have to say, I've had it this way. But the IDSA also is saying, hey, everyone build the script for this new fungal pathogen called Candida auris. It's on the rise and you need to know about it. So so then you say, all right, note to self, I have to start constructing it. And if you note the image behind me, I used a Wikipedia page there, and I did it for a reason. The script in our mind is really like a Wikipedia page. I used to teach it sort of as a static file that we build, but it's not quite like that. It is interacting with the other ones, my pneumonia script and my tuberculosis script interact. People make deposits in it all the time. Like sometimes people make corruptions and I have to fix it. It has this very dynamic nature to it, but that's what we do when we're building people's knowledge is we're trying to build the script, but only because it's one part of the clinical reasoning process. And the last part, and it's the most important part of all, um, is this ability to communicate it. So when all is said and done, a lot of that stuff is happening subconsciously. Like if a learner is working on a case, they may or may not articulate the problem representation. They may or may not reveal the uh, contents of their illness script for cholangitis or cholidocolithiasis or viral hepatitis in this jaundice case. That may or may not come out. But the one thing that's non-negotiable is I'm going to hear their impression. Or if, all's, if I've set it up right, I'm going to hear their impression. And the way it comes out is critical. The way the impression comes out is really, really critical. Because when we're all moving fast in clinic or the wards or the ED, sometimes you're so happy that the learner got the answer right. You're like, you know, um, that person came in with fever and a, a neck stiffness and altered mental status, and you think it's meningitis, and you're like, I do too. That's great. Let's go ahead. Let's get that LP going, and you're already off to the races. Um, but when you do that, you're actually shortchanging them and yourself because what you didn't get in that narrative is you didn't get a persuasive argument. The real, right, if we're talking about reasoning, reasoning is an exercise in rhetoric, and you have to expect from someone, and a, a learner should expect from you, a persuasive argument on what you think is going on. I was reminded of the importance of this. If I reflect back to school, I had an experience, and other people may have too. Um, in middle school, once I took a, a math test, and I turned, you know, I was in an assignment, and I took all the questions, and I was really good at math, so I got all of them right. I just nailed them. I went through it super fast, and I turned it back in. I was super excited, waiting for the accolades the next day. The next day, I get it. It's all red, top to bottom, 50%. Didn't get a fail, but I got a C. I was like, I know this stuff inside out. Teacher, what happened? 
why did I get 50%? She, I got all the answers right. She's like, you totally got all the answers right. But the key flaw, you didn't show your work. And I remember that lesson to this day, that the, the best teachers aren't interested just can you get the answer right, it's can you show your work. And in reasoning, nothing could be further from the truth. If that resident told me that that person has meningitis, I have no idea if they got to that because that's the only thing they know that causes fever and headache, because they heard that suggestion from another person, because they're anchoring on the last patient they saw. The only way for me to know that that learner is an advanced reasoner is if I can hear persuasive dif uh, differential diagnosis, where they do these three things. They name the um, problem accurately. That's the problem representation. They can tell me why something is more or less likely with the appropriate evidence, and they can rank things in that way. It's a lot to ask, but when you, do, when you get that narrative back, you're very convinced. And I've started to recognize that. I was like, you know what I need to do? I can't, I can't just have them tell it. I need to sell it. So I remember I'm getting, I'm like, yeah, I know you're going to tell me. It. Don't tell it. Sell it. Tell me what it is that you're doing. And I recognize this, that some people are incredibly intelligent. In some situations I see them, like they know something, but I don't think they have the whole picture. And when I walk them through this, that is our growth point. Um, the, the thing about this is sometimes it seems like it's pedantic. You're like, I know I have an advanced learner. There's no reason that they have to go through this. But I promise that when you make people do this, what you'll find is somewhere in this whole arc is a chance to improve their reasoning, even the smartest and the brightest that you have. And sometimes it makes you uh, uh, check yourself. You're like, listen, how often is that I'm happy that they got the right answer and I'm listening for the right answer instead of that I'm listening for a persuasive argument. So what I'm going to do is take a break here and ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, I just gave you a couple terms. I gave you the concept of problem representation. I gave you the concept of an illness script. I gave you the concept of a schema. And then we talked about the, uh, the final output, which is a persuasive differential diagnosis. That's the script selection we do. That's great. That's super helpful. But the question is, do we really need that to be good teachers of reasoning? Is it really important? We got tons of lingo already. Is it really important to have another set that we, we upload when we've already been teaching reasoning? So spend 60 seconds at your table and say, so I gave you those four terms. Does it really help me as a teacher if I know those? And do I need to share that with my learners? So just it's a reflection because anytime, again, we've been doing some, we all teach reasoning. Anytime we lob something out into the ether, a learner can grab it and put it in the right place and they can improve for the next time. So you can say, I've been teaching reasoning forever. Like you really need to build a whole lingo around this thing that's the same way I solve my life problems and my Wi-Fi problems and my car problems. Like how, how and why would lingo help? Like what's the, what's the upside of that? Terrific. I think language matters a lot because it does give a shared mental model what you're talking about. It sort of, um, it makes interaction. Once the learner knows this is the thing and you know this is the thing, then you can cut to the chase about where in their process it works out. We, we forget this, but like language is super efficient for communication, right? If we, um, you know, if we didn't have a word like aorta, every time we talk to each other, it'd be like, you know, that big red thing that leaves a heart every time and sends that blood everywhere. And we use that. And then someday someone said, let's start calling that thing the aorta because it's a lot faster. And this is the same way. In reasoning, you'll say, like, you know, I, I thought your problem representation was really good. My sense was that your illness script for hepatitis is not, as, viral hepatitis is not as well formed as your illness script for drug-induced. Is that right? And they'll be like, yeah, you know, now that you mentioned it, that's where I really struggled was differentiating the two. Um, now, to do that, you have to create a culture where it's talked a lot. I, in our residency, our department, I should say, of medicine, it's happened. And, I, and as much as I might credit me and some of the other faculty members who are super fans of this, the truth is the culture changed when the chief residents started adapting it, and this started becoming the words that they used in morning reports. And then it just became a, a daily thing, like, what is your problem representation for this KISS? What is the schema that we're using? So I don't think faculty alone can sort of change it. Or another thing that happens is if a course shows up in the UME. So Denise Connor, who's one of my colleagues, now teaches a course on diagnostic reasoning to the MS2s. And so by the time they land on the wards now, all of those basic terms are familiar. And it's not us teaching it, it's us reinforcing it. So that's one great value of having shared language. Any other thoughts why lingo might be helpful? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. That at some point, we sort of pick a framework, right? We say, like, this is the way we're going to go, but there's always competing ways uh, to, to slice the dice. And I'll talk about another one in a second. You know, sometimes we have uh, terminology and we're like, is this the right way to do it? But at least it's a starting point. Uh, you might think of a, a field like ethics. Like, ethics is a super important thing, like reasoning. To some degree, we have some of it just by living. Like, we know how to reason. We know how to be ethics, ethical based on the world we live in. But when people start giving us tools and nomenclature, it helps. Like, when someone taught us once that ethics is, you know, benevolence, non-malfeasance, social justice, and autonomy, and you have that four-part framework, you're like, all right, I can deal with normal ethics stuff, but now when I have a tricky situation, I know which levers and which categories to pull on. And so it may not be necessary for everyday world. And I think a lot of the upshot is like, you don't actually need to know this clinical reasoning uh, lingo if you want to do it. Um, you only really need it if you want you and your learners to do it better. That's the real purpose of it. I'm going to shift gears and ask you to just think about an exercise. If someone said, hey, can, do you mind just taking out a piece of paper? I'm going to give you a blank map of the United States and ask you to fill in all 50 states. Um, how do you think that would go? That is a lot of what we do sometimes when we say, what's your differential for X? So you'll hear oftentimes in morning reports and rounds and other places say, hey, give me your uh, differential for proteinuria. Hey, uh, give me your differential for monocular blindness. And, and the learner's like, what? They're, they're thinking the same thing. They're like, am I supposed to sort of just regurgitate the 50 states of the United States? But, but it turns out that both of those are incredibly cognitively demanding exercises. And they also ignore a reality of people who are expert thinkers, which is that the way that uh, knowledge is structured in memory absolutely affects its recall. So it's very important. The way the knowledge is structured in memory affects his recall. And great teachers understand that giving people a list is a very, very hopeless chance of being, having it recalled in real time. And one of the things that becomes very clear is as we give people categories to work on, instead of giving them lists to work on, they get very good at filling in the blanks. And that's the premise behind the push towards schemas in a lot of the clinical reasoning literature. The United States map analogy would be this, a big listen, that's a little bit ruthless for me to ask you to do all 50 states. Why don't we go region by region and try the Pacific Northwest? How many states can you remember there? Let's try the um, Mid-Atlantic. How many states do you remember there? Let's try the Northeast. How many states come to mind there? Then you would start to have a fighting chance if someone organized it. That's the premise behind why we use schemas, because it allows people to have an organizing structure for a very common problem. Remember, we're not, we are, we're not in the disease business. We start in the problem-solving business, and then we get down to diseases. So the diseases are at the illness script level. Um, I want to make a plug, uh, and this is something that I have a conflict of interest in, but the conflict of interest is only emotional, uh, and that two of, my, two of my mentees have created this marvelous podcast called The Clinical Problem Solvers. Uh, many of the medical students and some of the residents in internal medicine in particular know it, so I, my investment in it is strictly emotional. Um, and that is that they, they are now teaching clinical problem solving using cases and integrating all of this lingo and material that we're talking about. Um, in it, they really have two basic premises, which is terrific. The first, actually, is that anyone can come on the show and do clinical reasoning. So they don't bring old professors on and have them think through things. They do that from time to time, but their real premise is like, let's bring on medical students, let's bring on residents, and have them think through cases for our audience. They coach them, they guide them, and they show that anyone can do reasoning, which is awesome. And the second is that they don't make it an exercise in encyclopedic recall, but they do make it an exercise in, in um, knowledge structure by going through the schemas of how common problems like jaundice and syncope and visual loss and headache are categorized. Because they understand this truth, which is if you give people the categories, then they have, a, they have sort of a coat rack where they can start hanging all the bits and pieces of information. If you give them the map, they can pin things on it later. But if you just start lobbying information and lists to people, there's really no organizing structure. Now, Rabbi Jiha, who created this uh, framework for syncope, shows a really remarkable and detailed uh, approach to how you might write out a framework for someone or a schema for someone. And it's totally beautiful. It's totally accurate. But it is really hard to come up with in real time. Um, and to give you a reality check, that's an intro for the next exercise, which is I'm going to have you write a schema for something that you teach. That's what the piece of paper is on your table. I want to show you how I write schemas and how I do it more often as I'm trying to get better at this myself, which is stopping visually explaining things to people and starting, or sorry, and stopping my verbal explanations of things and starting with my visual explanation of things. 
So earlier this year, I work in urgent care. As I mentioned, I've been there for about 20 years, and so we see lots of knee pain. People come in with achy knees all the time. And one of the interns earlier this year, she um, came in and she uh, did a marvelous exam on the patient. She sort of um, you know, examined him, did all these named maneuvers, which I can't keep track of. Like, I've long forgotten, like, the difference between McBurney's point and uh, McMurray's maneuver and all these things. I go back and forth, and I said, she reported Lachman this and McBurray that and all these other named eponyms. I said, that's great, but let me tell you how I think of knee pain. And so I. I, I, I verbally explained it, but I said, you know, let me just write it out because it's a lot easier. It's like, this is what goes down in urgent care, at least in my mind. Um, and if there's anyone who's remotely orthopedics or sports medicine or rheumatologic, you should just cover your eyes and ears because I apologize in advance, but this is what I do, yeah. Is when people come in, we basically try to sort them and say, is there, any, is there any joint inflammation? Is there any form of arthritis? And then we spend a lot of energy, if there is, breaking that down in the algorithm to whether it's inflamed or whether it's infectious or crystalline or degenerative, traumatic kind of thing. Um, because it's urgent care, we probably spend a disproportionate amount of time worried about whether there's a fracture there. So we use the Ottawa knee rules, but then we make a judgment about whether we need to exclude a fracture. And then there's this huge bucket that's left over that's called musculoskeletal. Um, and you and I and everyone else has probably sat through a thousand lectures on the knee exam where you're taught these named things and positions and such to try to identify the structures, the ligaments, the meniscus, the cartilage, um, segments of bone I didn't even know existed that might be responsible for the knee pain. And I said, that is terrific. I said, I love that stuff, totally appreciate it, never memorized it. And um, because it, for us, once we get into that musculoskeletal category, as long as the joint is stable, non-inflamed, non-fracture, almost inevitably that person is walking out with some strategy of analgesia and immobilization and offloading that's going to let them heal. And you're going to be on another rotation later in orthopedics or rheumatology or sports medicine where some much more adroit and talented doctor is going to fill out that part of the branching algorithm, but we don't need to do that today. Um, and I could see the look of disappointment on her face. She's like, I traveled all across the country to come to UCSF, and this is, this is what I'm learning about knee pain. But I was like, trust me on this. Just try this out. And as we spent our month together in urgent care, she's like, you know, this is all right. Like, this sort of, this gets me through the first stage of it, and I recognize I'll do other electives where someone else builds out the rest of that tree. They're like, Dr. Dallow, all this is all right. Thanks. Um, and what I want you to do is think about that, is not hold yourself to perfection. When you're teaching someone a schema, you're not trying to replicate what's on up to date or in a textbook. You are really trying to give them an actionable approach to what you do. And it's totally fine if the way you do it is different from someone else's. So what I want you to do is grab the sheet of paper that's in the front, take the pen if you need it, and think about a disease that you teach often. You might, maybe it's uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding, maybe it's syncope, maybe it's hip pain. Maybe it's chest pain. Think about something that you teach, and it has to be a problem, right? It can't be the disease. It has to be the problem. Fever of unknown origin, a visual loss. Put that at the top of the page, and then challenge yourself for something that we probably normally just talk out loud to the learner and try to map out the schema. So you might be comfortable talking it out with the learner, but try to map out the schema. So pick your problem. Pick your A game. Hip pain, ankle pain, jaundice. But pick a problem and try to write out a schema. We'll take about uh, two minutes to do it. Disease, a problem that you solve, not a disease. Diseases are at the bottom of the algorithm, right? The problem is where we start. Just be one layer, two layers, that's all. That's where I stopped here. One of the things I discovered when I started doing this exercise more is there was a big difference between me knowing how to treat a patient uh, and me knowing how to explain a pro uh, process. There was a big difference between the two, and this exercise sometimes brings that out. All right, George, we'll do chimes. All right, so um, just, I don't need people to report out necessarily, but I just want to hear the problems that people uh, did at the top of their sheet. Can just people yell out the problems they did? With diarrhea, fever, nausea and vomiting, unreality, epigastric pain, is pep breastfeeding, Bone pain, weight loss, all of those are the problems that you contend with, and those are what people walk into clinic or the ER or urgent care with. Um, I'm interested to hear people's reflections on how it went sort of writing out a schema. Easy, hard, um, came out natural, it's the same one I use, I, I wrote differently than I think. Okay, you wanted to make it a matrix, right? It's hard, some things are hard to make linear, right? Um, but it's okay if yours winds up being a matrix or a hexagon or something, you just have to make it clear to the learner. It's that complicated, right? So sometimes it's not linear, other things you learn. Other things that people came up with. 
They're very automatic, yeah. That's right. And so one of the, you know, I mean, as a clinician, almost all the things that we're teaching, we know how to do. And without a, without a learner present, we might be on autopilot. Um, and sometimes even with a learner present, sometimes the way I verbalized it, I was like, well, I talked it up pretty good. I'm not, I think they got part of it. But when I put it on paper, then you realize, like, it's, it's a, the clarity that I have in my mind isn't exact. If I'm not getting it clear on paper, I'm probably not getting it clear verbally either. And it, it forces me to improve both of them. Any other observations on this? Yes. Okay, poor feeding in the newborn nursery is brought up. Oh, marvelous. So you think, yeah, sometimes the writing brings clarity, right? Yeah, I agree. And I've also found that, too, as the more I try this, and I, I have to tell you, as I'm trying to advance my teaching of reasoning, um, as I've started doing this, I've seen people's trans, you know, they do always give polite nods when I explain things. Like, is that clear? They're like, yeah, that's clear. Uh, to, to saying, like, you know, when I start writing it, I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not clear on this myself. And sometimes you go in that direction. Um, and so I just want to emphasize, it doesn't need to be perfect. It really, and it doesn't have to be like someone else. It just has to be an authentic way we think through things. You know, some of the ones that I write out and create now, I'm like, oh, there's, so, there's such relief. Like, um, you know, you, you think you should make it just perfectly, like, right, the way the things that the textbook are. But sometimes you're like, you know what, like, this is the way I see the world and this is the way I practice. You have tons of other people and medical education is predicated on you getting all our different schemas and putting it all together, right? Like, some things are ludicrous. I'll, you know, I'll, um, I'll, I'll explain. Okay, I need, I need the nephrologist and the endocrinologist to cover their ears now. But, like, here's my, here's how I teach hyponatremia, right? Like, in medicine, at least, uh, I say, listen, this is how it goes down, really. It's like, we look, someone's hyponatremic, and then we look at them, and if, like, if they're volume up, I give them diuresis, but if there's no, they're not volume up, they're getting a liter of normal saline. There's just no way around it. And if it doesn't go well, then I'm going to start thinking hard about it. And, like, that, that's my algorithm. That's my algorithm for hyponatremia. It's not pretty. It'll never get published. Published, but it's like my knee thing. It's entirely actionable. Um, and as we go through it, you say, listen, that solves like 90% of cases if I do that. And I'm very happy. I'm like, you will be on a nephrology rotation, or maybe uh, there's a day where we have a ton of time to go through all of the things, but that's the start of the schema that I teach. So it doesn't need to be perfect. Are you, you're not a nephrologist, are you? Oh, for sure, yeah. Once, once I know they know the map, then one of the most useful things is like going down the map and saying like, in your file, let's say your file for the hyponatremia is that, you know, this might be a diuretic induced hyponatremia, like what's your pretest probability? Then I can start to explore it on a per disease basis, right? The schema is a structure above all the specific diseases we're gonna contend with, but absolutely. Yes. The percentages are, I mean, the diseases are the same, but how they're represented is different. Um, I want to just make a plug for this sort of visual representation of diseases, because as I started to do this more and more, and as our world starts to become more visual and digital, I think it's going to be one of the ways that we come better and better at teaching clinical reasoning. Um, I try to use a whiteboard now more than I did before, more than I use my voice. So we had a patient who came in, an uh, elderly gentleman, a Marine, who had this diffuse rash over him. And he had gotten septra a couple days before. I think he had a febrile illness, and someone gave him uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, um, and then a couple days later, he comes in with a fever and, and this rash, and he looks ill. And so we're like, boy, this looks like he, the chain of reasoning is very likely like he got an antibiotic, he had some sort of reaction, and then among those different reactions we can sort, but that is what accounts for his fever and his ill appearance and his rash, and it was a very tidy scenario. But uh, one of the learners went back and said, well, what about the illness that started it all? It sounded very viral as the height of influenza. And sure enough, when we went back, he actually did have uh, influenza. He had PCR positive influenza. And then we had to sort of spin our wheels and say, wait, what's responsible for what parts of this? Like, is he, did he get a fever and a rash and illness because of influenza? Or did he get fever, illness, and a rash because of uh, the trimethoprim, uh, sulfamethoxazole? And I sort of explained it verbally. But as I was trying to explain, it's like, well, you know, it's sort of like this. And sometimes, you know, there's an analogy when people People have a mono and a mox, and sometimes that can cause a rash, and maybe I'm going to draw on that. And I can tell you for sure that influenza never causes a rash.
crash like this, so that's definitely not responsible. And as I was sort of lobbing out these different things and I was aware of the clarity in my mind, it was clear that no one else around me was. And so I decided like I owe it to them to show what's called my chain of reasoning. So another thing that people do when they storyboard now is you work on your chain of reasoning and say, let me try to make it as clear as I can for the cause and effect because that's how they're going to put together things themselves. And what I told them was like, you know what? I think influenza or the drug could account for two parts of this, but there's no way influenza causes a rash. I see hundreds of cases of influenza a year, and it doesn't cause a rash like that, so we're all good. Uh, and then right around then, the derm attending slipped a piece of paper under my door, and it's literally a piece of paper Dr. Morrow did, and she showed me case reports of like influenza-associated maculopapular rash. And I was like, all right, then I'm gonna give that, I'm gonna give that a dotted dash, but that's it, that's all you're getting to say that's possible as well. And that whole amox thing, like where was I drawing on that analogy? I'm just conceptualizing, because sometimes that's what we do in medicine, that maybe the influenza um, acts, the influenza and septa are acting in the same way that sometimes amox and EBV do and causing a rash, but I don't know more about it, so that's just a hypothesis. And I didn't, you know, in the end, we never really cracked this case. We sort of had two competing theories, and he got better with supportive care and removal of the drug. But by putting it on paper, my reasoning became infinitely better. And that is the practice I want you to think about. Like, use sheets of paper, use whiteboards, write on the glass if you can find it in the room. Try to clarify your chain of reasoning, because when we write it down, it always becomes better, or the, the weak points we have in it get brought out to bear, or in some cases, even the teaching. And I want to emphasize finally, as a last point, that even though I've been talking about diagnostic reasoning thus far, you really can see it in, um, in our regular old uh, therapeutic reasoning as well. We take it for granted that once we know the diagnosis, we know how to treat, but it's not clear that that's the case at all. Um, here's a case, and it came up in my conversations with the surgery clerkship director at our VA hospital. So he said, hey, I heard all your diagnostic reasoning stuff. He's like, that's great. Uh, but in my field, oftentimes when I'm working with the residents in particular, I want to hear about the therapeutic reasoning. I said, you know, it's the exact same thing. It's just the problem is the diagnosis, and then the scripts that you need to pull off the shelf are the treatment courses. Like, who needs an operation? Who needs a drain? Who needs antibiotics? And he said, yeah, it's the same thing. I don't want my R2 just to go down and have a report back to me like, I think he needs a drain. He's like, she's not showing her work. He's like, I want her to be able to say, this person has cholecystitis, and I think the most, uh, most prudent way we should proceed is with a drain. This person's too sick for an operation, I think, um, but certainly antibiotics alone aren't going to cut it. It's conceivable we could do an operation, but with the comorbidities, that's going to be risky. We'll have to do a modified procedure, but it definitely will not be acceptable to give antibiotics alone because the gangrene pattern on the CT scan, that's not going to end well. He said, that's the kind of narrative that you want to hear, um, and that's the same thing you could ask of a learner. So remember, a lot of this translates. When we're talking about diagnosis, it works in reasoning as well. Or sorry, when we talk about diagnosis, it works in therapeutics as well. A side note about uh, heuristics and biases. So one of the things that has become popular, even though I've been emphasizing building up knowledge and skills and schemas, there's been a parallel line of thought that has been, hey, wait, you don't need to worry about knowledge. Let's worry about how people think instead of what they're using to think. And this came to great popularity in the last decade or so, um, particularly because of the Nobel Prize that was awarded to Kahneman almost a decade ago, where they said, listen, there's a dual process how our brain deals with stuff. Stuff comes in, and I either have to categorize as something I'm familiar with, and then my mind works super fast. So in medicine, it might be I walk, hobble in with a big swollen toe, and I say, well, that's got to be gout. Or it's something that's kind of complicated, and I have to work through it. It might be complicated because I haven't seen it, or it might be complicated because I'm a brand new trainee, and this is just new to me. I haven't seen it, uh, but it will become common later. But in that situation, my brain has to work super hard. And if you want to find fans of System 1 reasoning, you can find them anywhere. Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, is sort of an homage to how well our brain works in terms of thin slicing things that we've dealt with. If you want to find a cautionary tale and an ode to System 2 thinking, which is you should stop and analyze really hard, you can use Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a 400-page tome, um, but you've got to give it some honors because the guy won the Nobel Prize for uh, coming up with all these ideas. Um, but in either case, we have to really decide, is this going to be helpful for us? Because when you go through it, the, the corollary to all of Kahneman's points is that we have these series of biases that our brain is susceptible to. This is the confirmation bias. You'll see it in politics, but you'll see it in medicine also. True. There's the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic is when something is recent or salient, it weighs heavy on my mind and I disproportionately weigh things. So, you know, last week someone came with a migraine or a headache. I called it a migraine. It wound up being a head bleed. You can bet my brain is going to start misestimating in the subsequent days 
the probability of all the other headaches I see being something serious. So there's no way around it. I'll eventually return to a baseline, but there's an asymptote. So you can uh, change covered in the news to covered in M&M &M or morning report or whatever it is you want, and all of a sudden our probabilities become distorted. And then finally there's anchoring. Anchoring is this concept where you say, I am hearing information, but I'm, I fell in love with this diagnosis and I cannot let go no matter what. It's like love at first sight. And you can't let go no matter how much countervailing information there is. And I found it's a really, really tricky thing. You know, um, oftentimes you'll see people, I remember when I learned this first, I said to a colleague, I was like, I, I, we were in the ER, and he was locked in on this diagnosis of kidney stone for someone. It was a trainee I was working with, and he's like, you know, he had seen a kidney stone case recently, and someone came in a flank pain, um, and he's like, you know, she sounds like a kidney stone, severe onset of acute flank pain, sounds like the patient I saw recently. I was like, man, you are getting hook, line, and sinkered. And I was like, did she have any hematuria? He's like, no. It's like, man, that, but still, keep testing. Did he have any hematuria on the UA? Uh, no. I'm like, well, now you're starting to get a little fishy because that's like 80%, 60 to 80% probability. How about on the ultrasound? The ultrasound, no hydronephrosis, no shadowing of a stone. I'm like, boy, you are really on thin ice. He's like, but I still think this sounds like a stone. Um, and I said, listen, you fell prey to confirmation bias, premature closure, anchoring, you name it. Like, go ahead, you be you. You, you give her, the, you call this kidney stone and we'll see what it is. But I got to say, like, I, I see every one of those errors in that step that you made. Um, and so he said, all right. And then I said, so there it is. I've laid out all of these heuristics and biases. You can see them as night follows day. Um, and we'll see how the patient's doing in two days. And she like, comes back in and she's like, hey doc, remember that strainer you gave me? Like <laughs> walking back in and here's that stone. And so when he was getting it all wrong, I was like, you have, I, I called him per premature closure, confirmation bias and anchoring and they all fit. But he comes back, he's like, what do you call it now? And I was like, it's called being a good doctor. Like <laughs> They got the diagnosis. And that is the key problem with all of these uh, heuristics and biases that we have fallen in love with, is that we've derived those names from all of the so-called error cases that come, but they're the exact same software that we use when we get it right as well. And that is the big flaw in them. They are true tendencies of the brain, but they are also are features of our brain that when we get things right. I, will, I won't belabor this, but I'll emphasize this in a study that was done by Laura Zwan. She's a cognitive psychologist in the Netherlands who did this study where she basically gave docs a series of cases and said, here's what this case sounds like. It sounds like pneumonia. It sounds like an MI. It sounds like a kidney stone. And then she changed just the last part of it for another set of doctors. Instead of a happy ending, she, the second set of doctors got the case. And in the final sentence, it switches to something else, meaning you know, the pneumonia case got antibiotics and did fine, or it sounded all the world like a pneumonia case. But in the last sentence, after the decision making is analyzed, it turns into a pulmonary embolism. Now, what she finds is that when you do that to docs and you tell them the happy ending and say this was, it was pneumonia and the person got better with antibiotics, she'll say, can you see any errors in there, any cognitive errors? And you know, docs can see a few. They'll be like, yeah, there was some uh, premature closure. But if you just change the last line of the case and say, do you see any flaws in their thinking? People would be like, oh man, that thing is full of errors. I would have never made any of those mistakes. And when you ask them to dissect each one of the cognitive biases, they will do the same thing. They will say there was more premature closure there was more confirmation bias. And it shows that we're really not good judges of the decision-making process. We're good judges of the outcome instead. Um, in each one of those scenarios, if things went right, you could see the error. But if things went wrong, people saw a lot more errors just by the last sentence. And it goes to a point that's oftentimes made in Silicon Valley. Oh, I'm sorry, before it's the, the bias that we're dealing with actually is hindsight bias. And that's probably the most bona fide of all. But it goes to a point in this that's oftentimes said in Silicon Valley with software, which is the problem isn't the problem in the software. Like, oh no, it's not a bug; it's an essential feature of the software. <laughs> Those heuristics and biases that we have actually under they are the undergirding of how we think. So the answer isn't to get rid of the shortcuts. It's just the way our brain solves problems. There's no way around them. The only thing you can do is improve the knowledge structures that we use to work under those conditions. So although I fell in love with the idea that those heuristics and biases would be the solution to med ed, they're not. Because what we're dealing with in med ed, and I apologize, I'll probably go another uh, five minutes if you'll indulge me, isn't going to be um, 
isn't it going to be teaching people how the brain goes right? It's going to be building knowledge structures in there so it goes, it goes right, or sorry, wrong, it goes right more often. Because this is what we do in med ed. Like, this is our core job in medical education. And pointing out to people how the brain goes wrong is never going to move people along in the spectrum. It's just not how the brain gets trained, and it's not how the brain works. Instead, you have to figure out a way to allow the brain to practice. And we talk about, we already spent the first half saying what you might do with the learner in front of you. But I want to tell you that there's ways that we can get them to practice that tap into one of these things, either the structure of their memory or the cognitive skills that we want them to do, framing or comparing or schemas or scripts. And I was inspired by one of these techniques recently when I saw it in an English professor who wrote this essay almost a year ago. He said, you know, I'm in the business too of making persuasive arguments. So what I do is when people give me persuasive arguments, I do what all English professors do. Three times a year I ask for an essay, they hand it back to me, and then I lob it back to them, and then I wait a couple weeks and do another one. I was like, you know, that sounds a lot like our H&Ps that we get from people, our presentations. It's like, you present acute kidney injury to me, I give you some critique, and I hope you figure out how to do better with John just a week later. And he said, that's not the way to do it. He said, the way I do it now is I take their essays, I critique them, and I give it back to them, and I say, send it back to me right now. But I don't do their whole thing, I just do the core part of their argument. And I started doing that with my assessment and plans with learners, and said, listen, I'm gonna stop grading the whole H&P, and I'm gonna focus on your assessment and plan, problem number one and number two, because that's where you're making persuasive argument. I cut my time in half and I cut my, uh, I doubled my coaching on the reasoning process. So I take their H&P and I do all sorts of track changes and comments and say, you're persuading me here, you're losing me there, um, you've done a nice job in, in specifying why this is septic growing, and the way you wrote this tells me that you understand the different forms of dementia. It has been liberating for me. Instead of spending all my time on the whole H&P, I get to the thrust of their argument. If I want to give them reading assignments for clinical reading practice now, I say, listen, I used to back in the day say you should read the NEJM, you should read Harrison, but I don't tell them any of that now. It's like the way you can learn and upload clinical reasoning practice is on the web now. And the way you do it, uh, just a, a small ode to this, is I use Twitter as one of the ways to teach them that you don't have to go to the New England Journal of Medicine anymore to get the same case practice we used to. There are places where they put cases on, online where you can learn them. Here's Pittsburgh, their morning report is available every day. If you want to attend, just follow them. If you want to learn cases from a lot of doctors who post them, just follow this handful. Here's a, a doc from uh, Johns Hopkins. He has a great case of a patient who has a nodule in their lungs on chemotherapy. Naturally, it raises the concern that this is a uh, metastasis. And what you learn from this quickly, in three minutes, is that sarcoma usually goes to the lung. Um, that when you do lung biopsies, there's a 10 to 15 percent rate of pneumothoraces and trans, uh, transthoracic. And most importantly, which is the lesson that's easily forgotten, is that this lung nodule isn't a cancer at all, but it's the MAC infection uh, that the person had because of their chemotherapy. All of that learning and practice going through a case gets uploaded in a short period of time. There's a pantheon of pa podcasts that we use in internal medicine now to convey cases and clinical reasoning concepts, and I send learners to these more than any other. So back in the day, if someone had a problem with sickle cell patient, very complicated, I want to know the pathophys, I want to know the new uh, use of hydroxyurea, I say, oh, there's a great review article in the New England Journal of Medicine. I don't say that anymore. I'll say, you know what? There's podcast number X on the curbsiders, and it was done by the director of the sickle cell clinic at the Johns Hopkins University, and she gave an amazing summary of key aspects and tricky parts of management and sickle cell disease go there. And now some people don't like that. They're like, just like me, I'd be like, listen, I didn't learn medicine that way, right? I didn't learn to use podcasts or Twitter or websites for uh, medical education, so I'm not going to point people there. And I was like, listen, I get to, I'm a fan of the NEJM CPC. I've been reading that thing since the day I was in MS3, and I have never missed a chance to learn from it. But I, I'd say this key point about medical education, which is that medical education isn't about how old doctors teach. Um, it's about how young doctors learn. And this is the way that they're learning. So you need not follow or like or listen, but you have to be aware that this is where uh, the knowledge is and where the education is being disseminated. And it's done in such a marvelous and brain-friendly way that once you see it, you can't help but gravitate. My final plug I have for you is the Human Diagnosis Project. This is something that I do every morning and I tell all my learners to do the same. I'm like, if you want to go get better at something, you have to go practice. If you want to work out, when you go to the gym, you're just trying to get reps in, right? Think of your day as taking care of patients as a series of reps and this is just getting in one more in in the morning. 
And so I do this thing where it sends me a case. It takes three minutes. My learners dig it as well. This was a case of a 25-year-old who's got a cough and then altered mental status. Winds up being mycoplasma-associated uh, pneumonia. And, sorry, mycoplasma-associated encephalitis. I never knew such a thing existed. I may or may not see it, but I'm a little bit the wiser because I did it. And you can do this in peds if you want. You can select just for pediatric cases, and every morning you can deal with weight gain and amenorrhea and respiratory distress and just get a little more practice before you roll in the door. The key thing, if you embark on this for yourself or if you embark on it for your learners and send them this, is like, this is tough, right? If you're giving yourself more cases and more challenges, then some days you're going to get the case right, some days you're going to get the case wrong, but every day you're going to get better. And that's the purpose. If you sign yourself or your learner up for clinical reasoning, that practice, that's really the message that you need to do. I wanted to remind us again, these are my closing thoughts. Our goal is to teach clinical reasoning because we want to move any learner, no matter where they are along the spectrum. This is what we do in med ed. This is what we're here for. We're here to change the trajectory of people. And if you ask yourself, am I teaching clinical reasoning, you are. Um, you're teaching clinical reasoning if you don't worry about how well they did this time, but you're just obsessed with the next time their brain sees this problem. How am I going to get them a little bit better? Then you're teaching clinical reasoning. You're teaching clinical reasoning if when you talk to them or when you listen to them, you're focusing on one of these things. And if they're a novice, you're modeling problem representation. If they're intermediate, you're saying, hey, let me show me, show me your schema. Let me see what you know how to do. And if they're advanced, you ask them to prioritize it back and forth and you debate with them. And you say, let's do this together. But you're somewhere on this axis of reasoning. And if you're going to send them on a reading assignment, you don't just say see more and read more. You say, I'm going to send you to some place where you get cases fast and furious because you realize the best part of practice isn't just that you're reading. It's that you're getting, you're getting quizzed and you're getting rehearsal. That's the real part of it. And I'll just close on this because I think it's the most important thing we do, which is in medicine, everyone is going to be great. Every single person that we're training, we bring super talented, well-meaning people into the system, and we want them to get better in everything we do. Every single thing we do, we want them to get better, whether it's their ethics or their communications or their stewardship or their high-value care, and it's their clinical reasoning as well. We want to do all of that. Um, but there is a difference. There is a big difference uh, between a teacher who, whose student or resident becomes great at clinical reasoning just as a byproduct of their teaching and a teacher whose student or resident becomes great at clinical reasoning because of their teaching. Uh, and the goal of a workshop like this, and the teachers are here, is to make sure that we're always in the latter category. So I thank you so much for your time and your attention. I know we're past time, so I will take questions afterwards uh, here at the podium. Thank you so much.